Uh, I want to thank you all for coming tonight uh, to our uh, uh, dinner lecture. And uh, I want to particularly thank the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory for uh, uh, hosting us in their uh, facilities here. Um, our talk tonight will be something that has uh, strikes me as a, a vital issue in uh, uh, system development, and that is uh, uh, why do systems fail? Particularly, why do large uh, systems fail? Our speaker will be uh, Dick Taylor, who is, uh, uh, frankly, the best system architect that I've met. Uh, he uh, teaches uh, classes over at the UMBC, and uh, he'll uh, be uh, telling us what uh, some of his real-world experiences have been. So without any further ado, uh, let's uh, introduce you to Dick, and we'll get started. All right. Terrific. <laughs> Good evening. Big systems fail, it seems like, disproportionately more than smaller systems. And I don't think that's an accident. Whenever there's a failure of a system, you can usually identify many causes. And I'm not going to pretend that what I'm going to describe tonight is the cause of all systems that fail. I mean, you can have lousy uh, uh, program management that just run it in the ditch. You can have uh, poor procedures that just uh, uh, don't bother to test it, and they wonder why it doesn't work. Or you can have just unqualified people who are developing it. But I will assert that underneath big system failures, ones that are surprises, that look like they were going to be successful, and then somehow at the last minute it's an utter disaster. Those typically have at their core, they have architectural problems. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. What are some of those problems and how can we avoid them? Now, I would argue that most systems that fail for architectural reasons, and those are the big surprise ones. Usually if it's lousy management or lousy process, it shows up early. It's not a big surprise. The big surprises tend to be for three reasons that, you'll, that I'll discover. But they, in general, are either because they don't perform or there's a complexity that overwhelms them. Function is tested early. It's tested throughout the development. And quite frankly, usually is gotten right. But the performance of the system that you saw in the lab, and then when you try to project it into the field, often is a very, very different argument. So the system that performs in the lab but doesn't resemble that in the field is a, is a common uh, failure of performance. And what's more, there seems to be this notion among some people that it's unknowable that you can't figure out what the performance is going to be until you actually see it in the field. That's nonsense. It can be done, but it won't happen accidentally. The other is complexity. When you've got a large number of systems interfacing to your system, how much of it bleeds through? How much of that complexity is absorbed into your system? So we'll talk about uh, each of those issues. All right, so with respect to performance, there are two, two general areas that I'd like to focus on, and one about complexity. Performance, the, the answer to most performance problems is scalable architecture. And that's a big topic that I can't possibly cover in this time, but I will give you some insights into where I think uh, scalable architectures come from. The second one is this notion of incremental performance testing. And I emphasize the performance testing. Yes, everybody does incremental testing of some form, but it's mainly functional. There is this tendency to delay for much too long the performance testing, which I would argue is the source of so many failures. Complexity, complexity lives in the interfaces. Quite frankly, it should live in the interfaces, but uh, they need to be very robust to keep that complexity from bleeding through. All right, what do we mean by performance? What are we looking for in a system when we talk about having uh, high performance? First of all, it needs to be predictable. And I'm saying that to say that, that you can predict what the performance will be before you actually deploy it. So you should be able to test something in the lab and make a prediction of what it's going to look like in the field. If you can't, that system is not scalable. Uh, but that's a very important issue. When I designed the system for the last two decennial censuses, you had something in the lab which was less than 
of what it was going to look like in the field. Yet when it was deployed, it was scalable, it was predictable exactly to what it was going to be. It can be done, but nothing in nature scales linearly by accident. Consistency. You'd like to be able to say that, that the performance is not just good when there are very few people signed on or very few people using the system, and then as it gets loaded up, the performance gets worse. You'd like a consistent performance, regardless of load. But these are the objectives. Flexible capacity. One of the characteristics of a successful system is that it will be used more than it was planned to be used. Because there's typically a pent-up um, demand which has been unsatisfied because of however the problem was solved in the past. So if it's going to be successful, it's got to be capable of going beyond what anybody ever saw, foresaw as the, uh, as the, the volume that was going to be demanded. Um, the, the last point here is physiologically, uh, it's been tested many, many times, most humans sense uh, response time at about 200 milliseconds. If, it's, if something occurs less than 200 milliseconds, it's perceived to be instantaneous. But if it's, if it's longer than 200 milliseconds, uh, there is that sense that, yes, I felt that. That was a delay. So when we're designing, we should be aiming at that target. Now, if you want to get you know, world-class athletes, uh, if they start less than 100 milliseconds after the gun goes off, it's declared a, a false start. Okay, They left after the gun went off, but they left so quickly that physiologically, it's supposed to be impossible for them to have reacted to the gun. They must have anticipated it. Well, that's a world-class athlete. That's why it's 100 milliseconds. The rest of us mortals, it's 200. And, and, uh, but that's an important point. We should be trying to design so that it's perceived to be instantaneous. All right, so let's talk about scalability, the most critical element of a large system. <clears throat> And, and I emphasize this as, as a large problem. All of these things work in smaller systems, but many systems change their behavior dramatically when they get beyond a certain critical mass. And invariably, there's some point of contention. Big database in the sky, everybody's trying to hit it. Well, in the small, that worked fine. But eventually, you hit a point where uh, everything affects everybody else. Scalability is the key. Now, when I'm referring to cluster here, I'm not referring to, I mean, there are lots of products out there that use the word cluster. I'm not being specific about any particular implement, uh, technology. I'm talking about the generic sense of clustering. So clustering is an abstraction where you take multiple computers and they, from the outside, look as if they're a single processor. So an input workload comes in, you've got some group of processors working together and they produce something which looks like it was a single processor. So this is what a cluster is in a very generic sense. Now it could be uh, something as simple as multiple servers all drawing transactions out of the same pool. So a single inbox is being serviced by five uh, servers. In some way they're just all feeding out of that same trough. Um, so in a sense, it looks like one processor. It just happens to have several instances. It may be much more complicated, much more involved, where you have multiple um, functions which need to be performed against a common workload. And each of the servers or groups of servers are doing something differently. So with the census, for example, a, a form comes in, and I got to recognize the handwriting. I got to look at the check boxes. I got to rotate the images. And all kinds of things have to happen. The clusters we used on the census were about 50 processors each, but all doing a variety of different things, but all uh, sized so they complemented each other. Um, but from, whoa, oh, back you go. Oh, well. Um, uh, here I am. Um, but from the outside, it is viewed as input, transition, output. It's an abstraction. But you've got to get them sized consistently inside, or else you'll wind up with choke points within the cluster, such that the whole cluster gets slowed down because of some process in the, in the middle. 
The key element and why this becomes so important to performance is that they're autonomous or largely autonomous. So the performance of every cluster is almost completely, it's not 100%, but almost completely independent of whether or not there are any other clusters and how many of them there are so, and, and how busy they are. Completely irrelevant. I liken it to, you know, if you've got 50 trucks all loaded up and traveling down the road, those 50 trucks are independent of each other. Let's assume that there's no contention on the road. And, and, uh, but that's, you want more trucks? We add more trucks. That same concept is here. We want to be able to add more clusters to increase the capacity because they don't have anything to do with each other. All right, how do we do this? <clears throat> The first important uh, concept to get a hold of is that any resources necessary to support a human activity must be internal to the cluster. You can't have a cluster and say, well, there's a function that needs to access some database that's big central database, and so we're going to go out there and reach it. It, it, it violates the basic uh, structure of a cluster because you're now going to be competing for some shared resource. So you've got to do one of two things with data that's outside. You've either got to partition it. Sometimes you can. You can say, well, all the users um, of one part of the database can be isolated with one cluster, and another part of the database, perhaps, in another cluster. More often, what has to happen, because you often can't control um, what users need what data, more often what happens is you simply say, I'll give you all a copy. But it's a copy. But I'll give each cluster a copy of the master. And then they will be able to get real-time response time without any contention between clusters. But they'll get a good response time because it was designed for just that number of, of users. And then you say, well, now what do I do? I've got all these databases I've got to synchronize. Yes, you do. But you don't do it while human beings are waiting. So you do it asynchronously. And depending on the need, it could be a trickle feed. It could be just seconds later that you're, you're trickling those transactions up and you're integrating the, the, um, the, the big database. Or it might be a once a night batch job. I mean, it depends on the domain and the latency requirements. But the point is, you don't do it while the user's waiting. Now, any of these things have to have some contention. So typically, they're drawing work from somewhere, and whoever's doling out the work is a common source, a common interface to all of these various clusters. But if that piece of the action is a tiny percent, my guideline is 1% or less of the overall work, then this will not. Uh, uh, allow contention between the, uh, uh, the the users of the various clusters. Uh, output is the same way. You don't want to expose the fact that there are many clusters to an outside external interface. So you would like to say each cluster, all right, dumps its output somewhere, and then once again, without any involvement or delay by the or perceived by the end user, you are now able to. Uh, integrate that data and, and make a single interface to your uh, external customer. Performance testing needs to be done incrementally. The power of this is you can test a cluster and expect it to perform the same if you have 10 clusters or 100 clusters because they are independent of each other. So you don't need all those in the lab. You need one or two in the lab, and the rest you can extrapolate uh, in a model. Just a, a quick example <coughs> of, of how it might look. If you have a, a, uh, a series of functions which require, which are identical in form, all right, these, these servers, let's suppose, and I have M of them, are all performing the same function but they're all getting their input from the same in-basket. So they're simply getting their data from a common in-basket. And so these can fail. They can be successful. They can have different implementations. 
And if forever, if, if at any point we decide we need more, we just add more. Uh, if you want to increase the availability, you can add more. These can be dynamically added because they're all just reading, they're getting their data from the same input source, from the same uh, in basket. And this is showing it as a workflow management implementation, which is a very good and a very common one. And the, the key here is that, of course, the workflow manager, when it gives work out to one of these uh, groups, or one of these instances within a cluster, it uh, remembers that it gave it out and remembers when it gave it out. And if it doesn't come back within a expected period of time, it assumes that it has failed and therefore uh, marks it as available to be checked out by somebody else. So we've got many of those and each of them is intended to um, address the same sizing metric, whatever it is that's, that's defining the, the entire cluster. So each of these can be thought of as a cluster, but then the entire bit can be viewed as a cluster as well. To take that one step further, don't think of a cluster as something that happens once in a system someplace. It happens many places. So this is what the 2010 census looked like, as a matter of fact. We had a bunch of scanners, a whole bunch of scanners. They had no idea who they were scanning for, or what they were scanning for. Their job was to turn paper into images. And they just did it and loaded a queue. All right, They just wrote it to a queue. And if they were down or up, they just created uh, data and put it in their queue. Each of these clusters use that as a bit of a, a rotary queue. They would look at a list of queues, and they would read them in whatever order we had predefined. But if there was nothing in this one, we'd go to the next one. Nothing in that one, go to the next one. And they would all do it. So I can add more scanners dynamically. I can add more clusters, take them away. These things are wired together, and they would continue to handle the load. On the opposite end, here again, we had 30 of these. I didn't, want, I didn't want to have 30 interfaces to my customer. So each of them, yep, would write their own, uh, their own output queue. And then we would integrate those together. Now, the key point of any replicable component is that you have to have a control mechanism to decide which of the replicable components is in play at any time. So, in this case, it was that rotary queue concept. These load them up and they just look at a list and pull them in. Here we had workflow driving it. But you've got replicability here everywhere. Years gone by, I used to think it was a, just a lucky thing. Once in a while, you saw something that was replicable. It's there all the time. You just got to see it. But you've got to look at it and you've got to see, is there something which is keeping it from being replicable? If there is, get it out of there. Move it in someplace else that you can isolate it. There are lots of places where the, the defining uh, metric isn't consistent. If it's not consistent, then you're not going to have any luck trying to put it together in the same cluster. Separate it. All right, so how do they satisfy performance? They're predictable because they were designed for a fixed load. And the capacity of the system is not a function of the capacity of a cluster. It's a function of how many clusters there were. Whatever the cluster's capacity is, you can have many of them, and that's what drives the overall system capacity. It's consistent because you're not interfering between the clusters. So the performance is independent of what else is going on around you. If you decide that, that your system now has more demand than it did before or than you expected, you just add more to it. And that is that turnpike effect, the fact that you know, roads will get used more if they're better roads. Well, the system will get used more if the system uh, is uh, more capable of handling volume. And it's not an anomaly. Uh, the, the human factors response time you get is not some idiosyncratic thing. This is something you can predict because you designed it for a specific uh, response time. So a cluster has a defined limit, just like that truck going down the road has a defined capacity. 
It doesn't handle more than that. If you want more than that, you add another cluster. You don't say, well, I'll just pile some more on top of the truck. OK, clustering. Most important part of architecture, it buys you out of all kinds of problems. Incremental performance testing is very much related to it because, as I pointed out, you can test a cluster independently of other clusters. But in addition, there are some other factors that need to come into play for, uh, for incremental testing. When you define subsystems, you're trying to find uh, relatively autonomous units, trying to minimize the interfaces, reduce the complexity between the interfaces, encapsulate data. You don't share data because whenever you share data, you get side effects. You know, if somebody in another system or another subsystem modifies your data, you didn't change a line of code and suddenly it behaves differently. You're getting zero divides where you never saw one before or whatever. Shouldn't happen encapsulate the data, provide data services where you need to share data, but don't let them access the data directly. Um, IPTs, you need to, to define the subsystems such that a single IPT is responsible for them. And, you know, uh, Fred Brooks in his classic book, Mythical Man Month, obviously talked about IPTs being something on the order of 10 people or less, addressing a subsystem. Now, if you have more than that, you still don't want to have hundreds of subsystems, but you can define layers between the system and the subsystem. You usually put a segment layer between them if the uh, system gets big enough. So you can hierarchically decompose it, but the key is each unit needs to be as, as uh, autonomous as possible and independently testable. Now, how do we make testing easier? Well, as I said, just don't do it. Don't ever share databases between systems. Years gone by, we used to think that was the way to do it, that, that databases didn't belong to systems. Databases were enterprise entities that everybody just had at. It doesn't work. Databases should be encapsulated within systems. That should be the defining force of a system. It's defined in terms of the data that it owns. Never permit another system to access your database. Just don't do it. There are no exceptions to that. You can always design a way around that. Now, I like to avoid, you can't necessarily do it always, but avoid synchronous interfaces between systems because that gets a very tight bonding to them. If you can make them asynchronous, they'll be stronger. And asynchronous does not mean slow. You can poll as fast as you want, but if you post a request and then sit there and wait, you're dependent on the other system to be up at the time you need it. No matter what he's committed to, if you can't control the design, you can't control whether it's really up or not. We'll talk about interfaces in a minute. Now, the same rules apply to subsystems, but a little softer because you're controlling the design of the subsystem of both sides, and so you can, you can control it. But at the same time, if you encapsulate the data, you bound them as be as autonomous as possible, then there again, you should be able to get those subsystems independently testable. And that's what we're trying to get. Clusters, I already mentioned, critical, but you should be able to, to um, uh, test a cluster. Now, a cluster may be part of a subsystem. A cluster might be part of a nested other cluster. But in each of those cases, it's a, it's a unit that can be tested performance tested by itself. Now, incremental integration is, uh, is really critical for testing, to build the system up. But here again, it won't happen without some decent planning and architecture that's partitionable. What I suggest is this. There are, I, I show three different increments now, in reality, you might have several types of, uh, you know, 2A, 2B, and a few 3A, 3Bs, if you like. But in general, the first increment should be the, the bones. You know, this is the basic structure that controls the process flow. Low on application, you got to have some little application in there just to prove it works. But the main focus 
is, is the workflow working? The communication vehicles between uh, components? Does the security piece work? You know, the, the basic structure and then some trivial little application. Now generally, that's not a, a, uh, an increment that you would ever deploy. Possible, but it's rare that it's, it's got enough critical mass. The next one, on the other hand, does offer that choice. These are the nominal paths. Lots of systems have this 80-20 rule, where 80% of their volume is running against 20% of the functionality. I've looked at banking systems where, you know, if, if you have a loan product and you give the guy money and he pays it back, I mean, how simple can it be? What gets complicated is when the collateral goes bad or the guy dies or moves or all kinds of exceptions. But they don't happen all that much. So if your nominal path is, I'm going to handle the mainstream, most common functionality, and I will stub out or I'll handle the exceptions in some exceptional way. You might be interfacing back to the old legacy system for a while. You might be actually doing it by certain manual approaches. But what happens is you've got something that actually works. That often can be deployed. Now, you may have planned to go all the way through and get them all done, but I've seen lots of times when you had a schedule, you ran out of time, and your choice now becomes, do I move the schedule, which is a very visible event to a lot of people, or do I simply say, I'm going to release it on schedule, but with less function, especially in the exceptional areas, on this release. I'll get them. I'll get them in the next release. So rather than simply say, no, we're not going to do it, or uh, we're not going to do anything until we have them all there, you wait to get the exceptional ones. Now, there'll always be some people who will say, well, ah, you, you delivered it late. You delivered some function late. But you can often deploy it. Now, when I say it's a, a, a program management issue as well, it's a planning issue, if you don't think about that, then what will happen is when you run out of time, what you'll discover is you've got exceptional stuff handled, and you've got some mainstream stuff, now nah, that's not ready. Develop it in the sequence such that it has the possibility of being deployed early. And even if you don't plan to do it, it gives you really strong feedback why you're building it. And if your contract is under, you know, has incentive uh, uh, awards, progress payments, that sort of thing, that supports it. Very hard for a customer to look at paper and say, oh yeah, I see, you're 56% done. It doesn't mean anything. When he's got something actually running, then they can say, I see progress, I'll give you money. So what does it do? It distributes the integration over time. That's a good thing. It gives you really early insight into system performance. And if you get a surprise, I've seen this before, where Kat's product simply doesn't perform the way I thought it was going to. Better to catch it early, call the vendor, find out what's going wrong, either throw that vendor out, if it's a, a true deficiency of the product, get him to fix it, or maybe you can accommodate it. But it shouldn't be a surprise when you're deploying the whole system. It should be uh, recognized much earlier. So you want to get early insight into the system performance. You've got the progress payment, as I said before, and it does offer you this back door. And I found this is something that's valuable. You don't, you don't even have to advertise this to your customer. That, oh yeah, by the way, this is buying me an insurance plan that says if I run out of time, I can deploy a partial release. You just do it that way. If the, if the time comes and he needs it, he'll be happy to embrace that. Okay, interfaces. Many times we think of interfaces as just a transit somehow between one system and another. That's not what an interface ought to be. Complexity lives in the interfaces. You've got to focus on the interfaces. The partitioning was critical to begin with because that's how you simplify what's going on at the interfaces. You say a database, drop dead, worst interface of all time. Don't use databases as interfaces. Files aren't any good. They're not as bad as databases, but they're no good either. 
transactions, you know, messages, that's what you're talking about, but even there, make them infrequent. But now, what do we do with, uh, how, how can we manage this complexity? <clears throat> what we're trying to do, our goal with our interfaces, is to minimize sensitivity to the internal characteristics of the systems to which you're interfacing. When you look at another system, it's got a lot of detail in it that you shouldn't have show through into your system. There's got to be some element of what he's, you've got a dependency on that data or he's got a dependency on you. But try to reduce that to some canonical form that is insensitive to the details that are, uh, are buried into their system. So if their system changes in massive ways, you'd like to be able to say, not only don't you have to tell me about it, I don't have to test it, it has no effect on me because my interface was strong enough to absorb that change. So how do we do it? Um, Christopher Alexander, the, one of the greatest architects ever, wasn't talking about systems the way we think of systems, but he talks about it looking through the interfaces. He said, don't just take an interface and, and assume that it's just you and the guy right across the boundary. What he's saying is look through it. If he's using your data, understand how he's using your data. Not that you're going to be sensitive, but you're going to get a sense of what might change. If, he, if you're using his data, look through to understand what he has to go through to generate that data for you. How might it be better? There's this whole concept of fit for use. You know, is the data that you're generating fit for use by the system to which it's going? To know that, you have to know what its use is. How is he using that data? With census, for example, we were, we were very aggressively trying to recognize handwriting and getting the details right. But on the other side of the, of the interface, the, uh, the next system was taking very detailed information and coding it. So things like, uh, ages and occupations and Indian tribes and whatever were no longer text strings. They were codes in a table. So fit for use really meant is it good enough to accurately map to a code? So the whatever there are 3,000 Indian tribe uh, in this country, you know, it's not some infinite combination of misspellings. It's a case of will it code correctly? That's the fit for use. So look through it understand how the data is going to be used or how, uh, uh, how you need to uh, accommodate them or how they need to accommodate you. But you're trying to anticipate where the changes could occur. You're looking so that internal to your system, you've got some canonical form. So you're saying, if I'm interfacing with 100 systems, or 50 systems, I, I just can't be that sensitive to it. So what you've got to do is say, these are my codes. This is the way I standardize my world. These are the units that I'm using, the precision that I'm using. Okay, the interfaces now have to be the gearbox. That's what I was trying to show in that introductory thing. There's a gearbox. It's not just a transition. It's, it's a gearbox that's, trans, that's, that's translating the data from one form to another and back again. When you can do that, you can absorb so much change in the, that the other systems may go through, but you can absorb it without any, uh, at any pain or impact. And so, I mean, when I say that systems fail because of complexity, my experience is that most of that complexity was generated by the systems to which it was interfacing. It's those external systems that are changing, and because you're sensitive to them, you have you absorb that 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 complexity. It's the sin eater uh, <laughs> construct, if you like. You're absorbing it instead of simply saying, "I've got a gearbox that masks that from me." So it's not a simple transit, and take those seriously. Uh, you know, I'm a, a, a big believer in uh, in agile approaches and agile technologies, but at the external interfaces, 
I want total specification. I need to really understand where those interfaces come. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater on that one. That one needs very rigorous understanding. That's where your um, uh, complexity gets smoothed out for the rest of the system that you're bringing, uh, that, that, you're, that your system is addressing. OK, that's really what I came to say. There are these three big weapons that you can bring to bear on the systems that you're designing. Scalability. Don't go by that. And incidentally, scalability has got nothing to do with technology. Nothing. The scalability is, is in the generic physical architecture, sometimes called the logical architecture, depending on what text you read. But it is, it is the way you partition the system before you assign specific products to it. What you've done, it's, it's physical in the sense that you have said this is going to be a physical component. So it's physical in that sense. It's generic in the sense that, but I haven't told you yet who manufactured it or what model it is or what, even what capacity it is. But that level of architecture is where scalability comes from. Because that's the one that says that component, I can have as many as I need. I can replicate it as many times as I want. That clustering concept is placed there. And then, you know, once the technology gets assigned to it, you say, oh, well, if it's that big, I only need two of them. Or maybe I need 10 of them, or whatever. But now you can vary it. And now that system has that, that uh, scalability uh, built into it. It also allows it to, to move for changing environments, changing volumes, and changing technology. Technology may say, well, it can do twice as much as the old one. Fine, maybe I don't need as many. But you shouldn't be constrained by the technology. The technology simply allows you to know how many you need. The fact that you can have as many as you need is something that was driven into the logical architecture. Incremental performance testing. Anybody that tells you you can't know what the system was going to perform like until you put it in the field doesn't understand it. You really have to be able to test the performance as you go. If you're a program manager, you want to insist on it. If your architect says you can't do it, fire them. I mean, that's awful. You can't, you can't build big systems that way. Because I guarantee you, a big system that hasn't been incrementally performance tested will not perform. There's way too many things that can go wrong if you haven't built it a piece at a time validating the performance at each step of the way. None of us are that lucky. There's too many things that can go wrong. Spend a lot of energy on the interfaces. Really understand what's going on between you and any other system. Look through those interfaces and say, I want to understand the details of your system, but I don't want anybody on the other side of my interface to see it. I don't want them to feel that, that uh, uh, complexity that you've got built in. Any place where you can make a, a canonical structure that is yours and unique to the way you process, that's the way you ought to be going. It shouldn't be sensitive to, to how many different ways that insurance companies or uh, whatever interface you've got, they all have different ways of doing things. That's not your problem. You've got to be able to bring it down to a consistent way of, uh, of within your system, of whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. OK, that's really what I came to say. As I say, there's a whole lot to what system architecture is about. But those are the big three in my mind. Get the scalability right, incrementally performance tested, and build robust um, external interfaces. And you have a much, much better chance of success. Are there any comments, questions, whatever? Yes. Uh, one second, Larry. Oh. You're online. Oh, I don't need the mic. I got a big mouth. Ah. Big mouth. Sorry, you're broadcasting. Um, if you gave this presentation five years ago, or maybe seven years ago, um, and then again, if you were to give it again in maybe two or three years, how do you think it would change, given how technology is changing, particularly with the computer systems you're talking about? That's a good question. I think what happens is the definition of what constitutes a big system. 
you know, if you go back in time, big systems by today's standard were quite small. And technology has allowed us to solve bigger and bigger problems just because they have embedded some of these principles inside the components. So if your components are scalable and have a lot of uh, uh, functionality, then they can hide the problem. But we are constantly be trying to address bigger and bigger problems. I mean, the systems that I work on these days have thousands of computers in them. And, and when you have that much connectivity, that many places where data can be placed and function can be placed, uh, it'll, it'll always continue to grow. I think that what, what it means is we're constantly able to build bigger systems. And bigger is allowed to be much bigger than last year and 10 years ago. I mean, right now, you've got a lot of cloud computing. You've got Hadoop, for example, that's doing a lot of these distributed things. And, and they do solve a lot of those problems. But there's still a limit to how, how big those systems can build. If you partition it right, there isn't any limit. Speaking of that, have you been able to see up here? There you are, Paul. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> um, speaking of that, do you have some good uh, commercial examples? Like I'm thinking of Netflix, Amazon. There, there's certain companies that have had to live and breathe this stuff, uh, Google. Um, and I was wondering, have you investigated what they've done and do, do they reflect kind of your uh, philosophy here? A lot of what they do is, is proprietary, and they're very reluctant to uh, disclose an awful lot of it. A lot of it I can guess, uh, but the truth is I've built a lot of them myself or been involved with, with huge systems, and uh, uh, so that's where most of that experience comes from. In general, the reason so many of them are failing is because the ones who can do it seem to be, first of all, relatively few, and secondly, relatively isolated. They don't they don't share that that capability. So, uh, uh, no, I won't give you a commercial for any particular company that does it very well. I think that the big ones, especially the big data ones, are uh, are. Uh, obvious that they're successful at it and obviously they're cracking the uh, the problem of scalability but a lot of those things a lot of things that when I mentioned uh, some of the the ways to build clusters there is this notion of of anticipating need so for example if you are going to uh, try to get high response to a an end user you've got to anticipate what data they're going to need because the data is all over the place and the speed of light is still going to dictate how fast you get it there. Um, so if you can look ahead and say uh, even something as simple as uh, uh, a, a caller ID, phone calls coming in, phone hasn't even rung yet, but you, you can know who it is that's calling. You can look in the database someplace and, and see if you can guess what that person might be calling about, some open case on something. And then you can ship data somewhere to where the wherever that phone is about to ring, that data is now going to be closed. You may not be right all the time, but if you're right enough of the time, exactly what the USAA as a matter of fact, uh, the, it, will, it will be such that you can uh, provide what looks like local access to data, even though it wasn't. Any more questions? I mean, Google, Google when, it, when it does a search, you know, and it comes back in a few milliseconds and says, oh, I just looked at uh, 10 million records. It didn't look at them right then. It's been anticipating that need and been crawling the databases continuously, building indexes and summaries and, and whatever. That, that notion of anticipating the need and getting spring-loaded, ready for it, is really the secret. Yes? I mean, when you finish watching, they know you're going to want walking dead. Yep, yep. You anticipate. You don't have to be right all the time. Yep. Any more questions? Steve? Uh, Dick, uh, would you be willing to critique the healthcare.gov issue against, <laughs> against your uh, architectural uh, keys to success? Uh, Obviously, this is a case where a lot of mistakes were made. Uh, 
I don't have personal insight into specifically what happened. I mean, I saw testimony before Congress and a few of those things, but you know, you'd have to look a lot deeper to understand what's really going on. I can only suspect that that many of these things were in play, especially the interface issue. Well, and especially the scalability issue. I mean, they're they're there. Uh, so where they went off the rails, I don't know. Uh, but that's a classic example of a very large system with very many external interfaces. Every insurance company has an interface to it. Um, so you can see where the kinds of things I was talking about are critically important, and obviously they didn't get it right. So uh, I don't want to say any more than that. I mean, there, I would have been happy to take a look at that, but that wasn't uh, that wasn't my job. <laughs> yes. Hang on, we have a question with Mike over here. Oh, you the mic. Have you identified a cluster size that's optimal so that? I imagine if you grow the cluster too large, you're going to have contention on the database. So you know what. Well, you're no, you, 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 the cluster is is tuned internally. You start a cluster by defining some uh, some defining element. So, for example, the clusters I was talking about with census, we we said, all right, there's a certain capacity I want for a cluster. The units came in, in in batches of 200 forms each and whatever. And so I would just throw a blanket over that and say, all right, your job is to turn, in one case, paper into uh, images. Another cluster was responsible for turning images into ASCII. And so once you define that basic defining unit, then said, all right, well, how many um, images into ASCII do you want to be able to handle in, let's say, an hour? Okay, once you define that, then you say, all right, now I'm going to have the character recognition engines that are suited to that. I'll have the uh, care, the uh, box, the checkbox, uh, whatever. And I'll have all the rest of the functions that I need to do sized to that constant um, metric. And then then it, it does become an issue of, of what is the ideal size, but it becomes then the scalable unit. So if you decide that when I started, uh, the census, I was saying I wanted each cluster, the, the big clusters, not the little ones in between, the big ones to be on the order of 2% of my total workload. So that says, all right, I was thinking in advance that I might have as many as 50 of these. But later on, when volume goes up, it gets bigger. When it, volume, when, when it turns out it was more efficient than before. So it really didn't matter too much, but it limited the the uh, geographic distribution. So for example, if you're going to spread these across multiple sites, you can't split a cluster. So you're going to have, that's a unit of distribution. So, <clears throat> so there's a certain overhead associated with a cluster. So that would argue to make them relatively big. But you want to be able to distribute them and incrementally add them. That suggests making them small. And it is a trade-off. Because that becomes the, the building block that once you exhaust one and you want to add another one, you have to add a whole other one, or whatever it is. So I don't think there's a, there's certainly no g generic, non-domain specific rule. Uh, but as I say, my first look at it is I look for something in that 2% range and then think I can scale that way. But that may turn out to be too much overhead for some domains. Yes. I think you've partially answered my question, but I'm going to try and state it in a somewhat different way. Several years ago, as part of a major assessment team, which was looking at the combination of performance, the uh, architectural evolution, um, and the total amount of effort to complete an extremely large job, um, the project was defined in basically three phases. The first phase had over 20,000 requirements. And this was after a major restart. So this gets towards the first thing is in this con context here, how and when do you know that you have sufficient stability of the fundamental requirement as yeah. opposed to requirements? Yeah. Uh, That's the first part of the question. Yeah, let me just say this. I should have mentioned it going in. If you ask, and I've asked a lot of people who were involved with disasters, what was the single biggest problem with your system? 
Why was it a disaster? There's a mantra. They all say the same thing. The requirements kept changing, to which I say, of course they did. That's the nature of our business. So anybody who thinks that you can't design to a, to a, uh, a relatively fluid requirements environment doesn't live in the real world. That's the way it is. Now, there are some things you do need to pin down. But in general, the flexibility of volume shouldn't matter. There are certain functional characteristics you got to get right. I find those are not as big an architectural issue because they can be solved in the small. So it's, it's, it's important to build the architecture with maximum flexibility rather than simply say, it's not my fault they change the requirements because I guarantee you they will change the requirements. That is just the nature of our business. And it doesn't give me any comfort to say, well, it's not my fault. You've got to be able to accommodate that. Uh, you know, when the, the, the census volume went up by 40% because the field was no longer able to send us electronic uh, feeds that were going to send us paper. 40% increase overnight. Could I have thrown up my hand and said, well, you should have told me. I would have designed it differently. No, no. I said, give me a little more floor space, a little more power, and I'll build it as big as you want it. And, and you should be able to, to accommodate that. Now, there are some functional issues that can be critical. I understand it. But I'd be cautious of anybody who simply blames changing requirements as a, uh, a cause for a system failure. That is usually not it. It's easy, you, changing requirements are usually a symptom of either poor organization that is not, doesn't have a, a decent process, or, and usually both, a bad architecture. It's too rigid. You had another one up. <laughs> yes, I do. It's a second, sort of a second part. I, I've, I've altered it based on listening to what you just had to say. The critical thing uh, that I wondered about is that at what point do you really begin to bring in the broad security issues? And what I want to get here is that you talked about the incrementalness yeah. of the testing. What is and then my question is because it seems to be an a misused, if not overused, integration function that it becomes you know sufficiently discrete that you begin to really track it as integration. I'm not exactly sure what you're what okay, you're getting uh, at there, but the, the, that he, the, the particular situation I'm actually referring to, which I have, uh, was an exceptionally large. It's the largest. Agile, fundamentally agile development system that I've been able to encounter any place, in or out of the public or private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, the critical time frame over the first three and a half year period averaged over 180 full time equivalent developers alone, plus all the other infrastructure. Yeah. I talked to people at Google, Microsoft, and a bunch of other places, and they said, What? That was the universal comment, the first comment out when I fundamentally described what was being done. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were shocked. And the fact that it was all agile. Some of the things that you talked about suggested to me, based on those conversations, which are now three plus years old, okay, they didn't quite use all of those terms, but their requirement was an incremental type of thing, generally responsive to a market. And I, and I think that's I think that's in general correct. That's where I was describing my reference to Agile before was that at the external interfaces, nothing no, nothing Agile about that. But when you're defining the functions, especially human interfaces and uh, the, the, those functional interfaces, you can be very soft on those and say let it let it emerge, let it evolve from the prototypes and from some early feedback, and that that makes sense to get started. But if the system is not partitioned well, and you don't have clear definition of boundaries, if you haven't taken this problem and, and subdivided into subsystems and components, which they can evolve independently of, of other ones, then, uh, uh, then it will thrash. Then all of that change will bleed through into not just the external interfaces, but the internal ones into the next subsystem, the next component. So but, it's, it's partitioning. It's all about partitioning. Final aspect of the question, how do you uh, suggest that people begin to estimate the cost of doing something like this with, with some reasonable accuracy? I'm not looking for precision. <laughs> well, this is a black art. I mean, the only, 
the only uh, uh, good estimate is based on design. All right. So you, the question is how much design you went through. My basic approach is that I develop a relatively high level architecture and then I take one sliver of it and I drive it all the way to the bottom and it's a sliver that I understand pretty well. And so, all right, this, all right, now this is how it's going to get decomposed. And then, once I've got that done, I use that as the benchmark against all others. I say, oh, well, this over here, that's half as much as this. This one, twice as much as that. And you, so you're comparing it to something that you've actually driven down. But that is, um, that's based on design and a lot of judgment. But nevertheless, it's not based on some generic set of metrics, uh, productivity measures, and uh, I mean, those work in some cases, but for big systems, I don't think they work. I think the only reliable estimates are based on real design. Last question here. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, go back to slide 12 if you could. Um, I want to talk, um, answer your um, Yeah, the IPT to IPT communications right. to interfaces. So if there's internal you know, IPT to the different parts of the system, but they also have to realize a subsystem, you know, the uh, subsystem or you know, system to the environment. And uh, you know, you have to really, you know, you can't have be stovepiped. No, no, it's, not at all. And, and, and that's where, uh, you know, things can fail. You, you make a good point. Now, um, what I'm thinking of here is in terms of the, the, the function and the performance of, a, of a, a particular subsystem ought to be defined to a particular IPT. What I've always found successful is that certain disciplines, security among them, database design among them, communications, networking, um, tend to, and, and uh, human factor specialists, tend to be uh, disciplines which need to get shared across multiple IPTs. So what I do in those cases is have the same person, you know, you get 10% or 20% of this user interface specialist and, and so much of the security one. But then you've got the dedicated ones that are responsible for building that specific function that they are completely dedicated. So some of the communication takes place just by virtue of joint membership of some of the, of the, uh, the disciplines in systems engineering. But the application specific, the database specific shouldn't span it because it should be partitioned well enough so that they can confine themselves to the interfaces. Yeah, but if you have a situation where they don't realize uh, there's an issue with the system operationally, say, to the environment, then it could, um, and you have different groups or divisions well, yeah. play, you could, you know, there's a money factor in there too to uh, do these studies or, or uh, anticipate alleviating the problem. But that's why I emphasize that first increment needs to be the one that addresses itself to the, the uh, communication, the control mechanisms, the security, those things. You get that part working, and now you're plugging in application subsystems as you need them. They should, they should not directly affect the, uh, the underpinnings, the underlying structure. That should already be in place. But you need to build it in that order, or else you'll be still solving those problems with application developers who are, you know, don't have a global enough view to make that call. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've run you uh, longer than you. No problem. Planning. I usually run a little bit <laughs> over. So before we close out, I just uh, wanted to hand over the mic to Gundars Oswald. He's going to explain some of what we'll be doing next month, especially with regards to the similarity between our two events, our dinner lecture and our workshop. Well, I'm Gundars. I'm going to give the presentation on the 21st. And we're going to be talking about a paper that we wrote, uh, the Agile Working Group, uh, sponsored by Nintosi. Uh, and we had four authors on it uh, that uh, worked for about a year and looking at how system engineers can play in the Agile software field. You know, uh, I call it, you know, how can we join the party? Um, <clears throat> now, the other 
presentation by Suzette Johnson um, or training session on the 10th, uh, she's going to talk about training you in agile methodologies. And a lot of us system engineers had to learn that over, you know, have learned it. Others, you know, you're not aware of it. You hear the words, and there's a misconception of what it means. So that she's actually doing a training session where you actually experience and doing some 